About three years ago, I decided to write a novel about Muslims. I thought it would be easy. I was born a Muslim, and I could just write about what I know, except I knew nothing. And the reason I knew nothing was because I had a very strange and eccentric religious education authored by my father, who was a socialist. And uh, I don't know if any of you are Muslims out there, but there's a, a tradition, you know, people invite someone called a huzur into their house, and the man comes maybe once a week, and he teaches your children to read from the Quran, to memorize the Quran. And my parents were very much against this because they were against the kind of rote learning. Um, and we were living in Thailand at the time, very strangely, and there was a very small community of Bangladeshis, and they all employed the same huzur. And he would go to everyone's house on Sunday, one at a time, and teach each of their children, except he would never come to our house. And there was a lot of speculation in the community about what would happen to this child who's, whose house the huzur never visited. And I was that child. But instead, on Sundays, we went to the video store. And at the video store, I was allowed to choose one film that was of historical or religious significance. So we watched the great Hollywood studio films like The Ten Commandments, um, Ben-Hur. Uh, we, we watched, there's one film about, about the Prophet Muhammad called The Messenger, we watched that. But we also watched, you know, we watched Gandhi, that was part of the program. And so I sort of grew up thinking that, you know, God has the voice of Charlton Heston and the cleft chin of Kirk Douglas. Um, and as a result, when I came to write this book, I was woefully ignorant. But more seriously, I have always felt a deep ambivalence about Islam because it's been very difficult to square my education, my aspirations, and my freedoms with the way that I have seen the faith being observed around the world and in my country, in Bangladesh. And I have never been able to, 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 to find a way to reconcile those two things. And I've had a real problem with that. And, um, it was almost impossible for me to think of a way um, to, to have a kind of sympathetic and, um, and sweet understanding of the faith that I needed to have. On the other hand, um, I felt quite protective of Muslims when I was confronted with a lot of the stereotypes that we see that are so pervasive these days. And I found myself saying to people, oh well, you know, there's no such thing as the Muslim world. There are many Muslim worlds. We don't all wear veils. Um, different Muslims practice differently in different countries and different communities. Um, and uh, this was, you know, a, a kind of protective feeling that I always used to get. So when I came to write the book, there were these two competing demands. There was the, there was the resistance, there was the alienation, but there was also a desire to belong and to have a kind of citizenship to that, with that community, which is possibly why I had this urgent impulse to write the book. But luckily, I'm a novelist, so I get to tell tales, and I also get to read tales and get inspiration from other writers. And one of the writers that I started to learn from um, is called Rukia Sakawat Hossein, and you, if you're not Bengali, you may not have heard of her. She was um, around at the turn of the 20th century, um, and she, um, sorry, she, was, uh, she wrote uh, her best book in 1905, and it's called Sultana's Dream, and we now know it to be one of the first depictions of a feminist utopia. So in Sultana's Dream, um, she creates a world called Ladyland, and in Ladyland, the women rule the world, and the men are basically, they live in cages. Um, and, and this idea came to Rukia because in her, in her day, women lived in a sequestered part of a house called a zinana. And um, she created this idea of a mardana, and mard means man in Urdu. So in Ladyland, the women rule and the men live in the mardana. And everything is beautiful and peaceful, and, the, and women fight off attackers from other worlds, other countries, using solar power. They create these giant mirrors, and they're so hot, they reflect the sun, that no one dares to attack them. So this is the kind of utopian ideal of Ladyland. But Rukia didn't just write novels, she was also a critic of Muslims. She was a great critic of Parda, and of the segregation that made it impossible for women to participate 
in political and public life. In addition to that, she created the first ever school for Muslim girls in Bengal. And many women of my grandmother's generation attended school for the first time because of Rokea Sakawat Hussein, and her school is still around um, in Bengal today. So I was inspired by Rokea because she um, was, a, was, a, was a critic of the faith, but she also worked within the community, and she worked for the community, and this was part of her kind of social and literary program. The other artist that I drew great inspiration from was um, the filmmaker Shatujit Rai. Um, you may have seen the Apu trilogy. Shatujit Rai made a film in 1960 that was based on a, sh a Bengali short story, and the film is called Devi. And in this, it's about a young woman, and she marries into a very wealthy family, a very conservative family, and she lives in this great big house, and she's kind of trapped in this house, and her only ally is her husband. Her husband is a progressive modern man, and um, they both feel really oppressed by this house and by this family. So they had to plan, which is that he's going to go away to university in the city, and when he gets a job, he's going to bring her with him, and they're going to create this kind of modern nuclear family. So he goes away, and she's left to take care of her father-in-law. And her father-in-law wakes up one day, and he says, I've had a dream. I've had a dream that you are the reincarnation of the goddess Kali. So of course, the woman doesn't believe this at all. But because the father-in-law is the patriarch, she has to do what he says. She sits in the temple and agrees to be the incarnation of the goddess Kali. And people come from all over the land to pay respects to her, to bring her offerings, and to be healed. And one day, someone places a small child in her lap, a very sick child. And the child is about to die. And she spends the whole night with him. And in the morning, he's made a miraculous recovery. And this is the moment when the young woman transforms herself and starts to believe that she is, in fact, the Devi. And of course, as you, as you can imagine, I won't give the ending away. It has disastrous consequences for, for her and for the family. And this film pointed me to um, a, a major challenge or conundrum that I would have in, in writing about faith, not just about Muslims, but about any faith, which is how do you capture that moment of religious epiphany, of religious ecstasy, the moment when a person goes from becoming a person of the world to having a sense of the other world, a sense of the afterlife, a sense of something greater, what William James calls the reality of the unseen. And I knew I was going to have great trouble capturing this, if I could even do it at all. And I wondered what I would do. And ultimately, I came to another story. And this one was one that I borrowed from my family. You can change the slide now. The story takes place during the Bangladesh War of Independence. As some of you may know, Bangladesh used to be called East Pakistan. And we gained our independence through a very brutal and bloody war. Many millions of people were killed. And there was a, a, a massive campaign of violence and ethnic cleansing by the Pakistan army on a basically civilian population. But one of the stories that doesn't get told about this war is that after the war ended, and all of these young men who had been fighting for freedom came back from the war, they killed a lot of innocent people who they believed had collaborated with the Pakistan army during the war. And of course, the story of the Bangladesh genocide doesn't get told that much at all. And certainly, the story of these deaths that happened afterwards don't get told. And I, I wrote a novel about this war. And even I sort of pretended that I didn't know this history myself. Until years later, um, I wrote the book. And then I realized, I found out that, that there was a story in my family, um, a secret story. And it goes like this. I had an uncle called Shad. He was from the Pakistani side of our family. And he would only visit very rarely. He'd only come to Bangladesh. I maybe saw him once or twice in my childhood. And I used to love whenever he visited because he was very charismatic. He was a brilliant mathematician. And he had a French wife, which really added to his glamour in my eyes. Um, but whenever he came, there was um, a ripple in the family. People tiptoed around him. They didn't want to talk about his father. And what I discovered was that his father was killed by the Mukti Bahini, by the freedom fighters. And of course, he was innocent. He didn't collaborate with the army. And their family was torn apart, and they had to leave. So I started thinking about the story of a soldier. 
a young man, maybe he's still a teenager, he's just survived the war, he's seen terrible things. Those nine months of the war have felt like a lifetime to him. And now the war is over, and he's starting to feel some of the euphoria of this new country that he has just liberated. And yet, he cannot really suppress his rage. He's seen so much. He's seen much more than he should have in his young years. And he's walking back from the war, and this rage is bubbling inside him. And he comes across a man, and he convinces himself that this man was a collaborator. And he kills this man. And nothing is ever the same again. His moral scaffolding has completely come down. Everything he believed in has collapsed. He feels a great emptiness, a great void inside him. And as his friends and his family celebrate the new country, he can't feel any joy. And he's sitting at home, and he doesn't eat. He can't sleep. He's pacing the halls. And so his mother comes to him, and she starts to read to him from the Quran. And at first, he doesn't listen to her. He turns away, and she says, it's OK. You don't have to listen. Just sit here while I read. And so he sits in her presence, and he listens to her voice very soothingly, reading these Arabic words that he doesn't understand. And then slowly, he begins to get interested, because none of his other books make any sense to him anymore. He tries to read his nationalist texts. He tries to read Marx. He tries to read poetry. He listens to the words, and something shifts inside him. And he starts to read the book. And he decides, or he realizes, that the book is telling him that he's good. The book is the only thing that believes he is good. And I had to read the Quran to research this book. And in fact, there's a, there's a strong thread through it, which is about how human beings are kind of essentially good. Not sinful, but good, born with a kind of moral integrity and a moral goodness. So he reads from the book, and he believes the book is telling him he is good. And he's changed. And his whole life changes as a result. It's completely transformed. And if you'll allow me, I'll just read a very, very small paragraph. This was how it began. It hurt her to remember this, because everything that happened afterwards could be traced to Sohail's first steps towards God, beginning with the book that she gave him, that gathered dust on his bookshelf, that she prized from between Neruda and Ghalib, that she read aloud while he ate his breakfast, that he was unable to resist, that he began to memorize, then understand, then love, that finally fell into his hands as he learned to read, that wove itself into his heart, that led to revelation and his conversion, the alchemy of which none of his loved ones could trace to a single moment, a single gesture. So if I can leave you with, with a thought, it would be the importance of particularity, the importance of specificity, because perhaps it's impossible to capture that moment of alchemy, but it's possible to create a world, to create a history behind a person that makes that moment possible. And so the answer to the question, how do you write about Muslims, is very short. The answer is one at a time. You write one at a time, and you write one life at a time, one history at a time, one conflicted, vexed, believing, non-believing, skeptical, wholehearted, ambivalent life at a time. Thank you.